So this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we have Steve North, uh, who's a, uh, he's a founder of the Facebook page Living in Modern Times. He has a, um, a business, uh, Glass and Window, you said? Glass and Window? Glass doors and locks, yes. yes. Glass doors and locks, so he's intimately involved with the uh, broken window fallacy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's not a fallacy for us, though. Not a fallacy, yeah, right? <laughs> it actually works. It's an income. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, um, Steve, uh, tell us about a little bit about your business. So, yeah, it's actually my sister's business that she started about three years ago. Um, she was working for a large company for about 12 years. Um, basically, the company she worked for did what we do now. It's a subcontracting business. So we work with big companies all across the country, basically any type of chain organization. It's a lot of restaurants that we work with and our customers will call us anytime they have a problem, and um, it's emergency service basis, so we're 24-7. We always have to be available, have somebody available. 24-7, um, huh? Yeah, we coordinate the jobs and uh, just make sure that everything gets taken care of promptly and that the jobs go smoothly. Nice, nice. So so tell me about some of the um, the regulations that you have to comply with or or circumvent, I guess. <laughs> 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 well, we don't do much circumvention just because, um, you know, we don't want to go to jail necessarily, and Damn we'd it. like to keep the business going, you know, exactly, yeah. if there wasn't that proverbial gun to our heads, we yeah. would probably do more uh, circumventing of the laws, but yeah. basically, um, it's pretty complex, the tax codes vary from state to state from city to city, et cetera, and it really takes quite a bit of work and time to keep up with everything. Um, actually, you know, it takes away from my sister's ability to do more productive things with the business when she's spending, you know, a day or two a month literally making sure that um, we're up to speed with all the uh, tax payments and whatnot. Like I had mentioned exactly. before... You're off by one cent sometimes on a payment, and they'll fine you fifty or a hundred dollars. It's really kind of ridiculous. It's because, it's because you're a criminal. What can you say? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're we're hurting people you're, by not paying. You, you, that you, you, one you're, cent. you're trying. You're trying to have less money stolen from you. So therefore, you're criminal. <laughs> <laughs> Any other time, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, of course, you know the Affordable Care Act, which applies to all businesses nowadays, um, applies to us as well. So um, we're forced to offer health insurance to our employees or sign up for the Affordable Care Act. And uh, because they, you know, these insurance companies are guaranteed money, basically, because people are forced to buy insurance now or pay a penalty, um, the prices, of course, go up rather than down. Uh, this year, they're up 40%. So that impacts the business and the ability to invest in new employees, infrastructure, etc. Yeah. Um, and so basically, they gave us the choice, either pay 40% more this year or sign up for Affordable Care Act, which you can never get out of in the future. So we stuck with the insurance. Yeah. Um, you know, that sounds like Hotel California, right? You can check in, but you can't check out, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> <in comparison. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those um, those opportunity costs. Uh, I can, I, I understand that intimately now. Like uh, now that I'm studying this more, like what you said, you know, your your sister she has to devote this time to just making sure that she's paying the right amount of taxes and you know complying with the law. And what what could she have done for the business had she not wasted that amount of time, right? Right, exactly. And, and not to mention the money that you guys, you know, uh, you know, the extra money you would have if you hadn't not had to uh, forfeit it to the local mafia, or the <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but yeah, um, that's uh, and, and so now it's three years now, right? That you have the business. 
Yeah, she worked for another company for about 12 years, and now we've been around for three years. And despite the fact that um, we're forced to pay so much money to the uh, local mafia, yeah. um, still things are going very well because it's a service that um, is really in demand. Um, you know, glass and doors never stop breaking. Yeah. So, <laughs> True. Uh, <laughs> Especially glass in particular, it's rather fragile. Especially glass, definitely. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I think she really was quite smart in seeing that there was such a demand for this. Despite the fact that there was other companies that do what we do, um, she knew that she could do it as good or better than they do. Um, and, you know, we'll, we work with national subcontractors, so the good thing is they're making money. We're making money, and the customers are happy with the service. So it's completely voluntary for everybody. We don't force our customers to sign contracts with us. Uh, we don't force the vendors to sign contracts with us. Um, everybody can come and go as they please. Wait, so, you, so you're the saying there's, there's no guns involved? What kind of a no business? Guns what kind involved? Of business? <laughs> <laughs> So nothing yeah. like the government then, right? It's amazing. Sometimes you uh, <laughs> realize when there's no guns involved, things can actually work with voluntary cooperation. It's, uh, it's a fantasy world, I'm telling you. I, I, I tell people about it all the time, and they just don't believe me. You know, I'm like, I'm like uh, yeah, I tell people that, you know, when, I, when you mention the word anarchy to somebody, they, they immediately get defensive, you know, and, uh, and sometimes even angry. But then when you say, well you know, you have basic anarchy in most of your life, right? Why do you treat your friends and family with decency and respect, right? Or your loved one? Why do you, why do you have, you know, why are you nice to them? Are you nice to them because the law has told you to be nice to them? Or do you understand that if you want to continue to have friends, then you should perhaps be nice to them? <laughs> you know, right. simple, yeah. simple laws of morality, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, if they stopped having police with guns in the streets tomorrow would you or i go out and start robbing our neighbors exactly. uh, i think not <laughs> well, some people would but i don't think that they would last very long to be honest exactly and, and well, i guess it depends if they saw that movie right the purge yes <laughs> Did you, did you see that movie at all? Or, or? I haven't yet. No, I saw the uh, previews for it. It yeah. made me a little bit sick to my stomach. Really? I know. It's just, uh, it's really amazing, the propaganda. Um, like, like for example, with my my kids, right? I'm, I, um, I, just, I take care of my kids. I'm like a stay-at-home dad now that I, I left my job a few months ago. Um, and so I take them to the libraries often, right? And uh, and now it's interesting that um, now that the school year started, the only books that are on display for that for the kids to read are like you know first day of school, <laughs> first yeah. day of middle school, first day of kindergarten. You know, so it's like really preparing them for school. You know, yeah. and uh, and my kids sometimes ask me like, what school? You know, they don't know. I mean, my, my, my I mean, my, my oldest is still young. He's four. And my my uh, uh, and the youngest is two, mm -hmm. but uh, but yeah, I mean they're gonna stay as far away from that <laughs> as possible. I mean, and and you know that kind of angers some of my family members because yeah, you know, actually the first thing people say is how can you be so against the government when you use libraries and you use the roads? Why do you? Why don't you just stop using roads? <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty simple, right? Yeah, yeah. So. So, so what, Stay in your house all day. Do, do, <laughs> does, does, it, does anybody give you those kind of arguments? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, I mean, so what do you? How do you respond to that? Um, basically, I tell them that um, things that have demand would exist uh, with or without government. I mean, um, if you need a way to get from here to there. Um, if you need a way to get to the grocery store and it's in everybody's interest, our interest and the business's interest to have a way to get back and forth, it's only um, I think people would come together and figure out a way to build that flat space to drive <laughs> on. 
You know, it's impossible. I mean, it's it, it, it requires <laughs> gun, it, it requires guns. It needs guns. It's, it wouldn't yes. exist without guns. <laughs> but but yeah, it's uh, some of these arguments are quite um, illogical, and and same thing goes with libraries. Like like you know, you say you're you know you're you're an anarchist, and they're like, what do you hate libraries? You what, you don't want people you don't want people to read books. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> right. You don't want the children to be educated. Like, exactly, as if you know it's either, and, and that's actually you know what I've been learning recently is uh, various um, uh, logical fallacies. This has been interesting to me a lot recently. I've been following this guy Mark Stevens. Uh, I don't know if you heard of him, uh, MarkStevens.net, and uh, what basically what he does is he he goes he's a voluntarist anarchist. He goes to court with his clients and he basically goes head to head with judges and lawyers and basically tells them prove to me that the law applies to me show me evidence that the constitution applies to my client just because he's physically in this state <laughs> right and he does an excellent job and every single argument that they give is a logical fallacy you know, right. it's an appeal. It, I don't know if you, if you, if you look at there's a, there's a website just devoted to um, explaining logical fallacies, like you know the appeal to force, which is called argumentum ad baculum, right? Which is just just like you know, of course it applies to you because if you do if you don't do it, you're going to go to jail. <laughs> but I mean, right. that's not evidence. That's just like okay, you can hurt me. That's that's not evidence. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's... and and there's just so many. And uh, and like and like uh, you know regarding um, uh, schools, like you say, you're against public schools. You're like what? You don't want kids to learn. Edu you know what? You're against education. Then that would be the black and white fallacy. Like there's only two options. These are right. government school or everybody doesn't read. It's <laughs> you know? So it's um, I find that yeah pretty fascinating. I've been learning about that a lot. Um, yeah, that's something I'm actually interested in learning more about because. Yeah. You know, when you're writing and when you're debating people online, for example, you don't want to be, you know, using logical fallacies on your own. Exactly, exactly. Like, and yeah, you want to be able to point out when other people are as well. Oh, so. it's, it's really helpful. I, I really um, got a very serious interest in it because it, like, really improves your debating skills, you know, when you can just, you know, take apart, some, dissect somebody's argument and say, you know, this is rife with fallacies. Right. <laughs> Please restructure your argument, and they'll and and you know, and then they come at you even angrier. It's like, well, that's another fallacy. They get so pissed off. But um, but but you know what? Let me let, let me ask you about your page, Living in Modern Times. Um, so sure. how long have you had that for? Um, I guess it's now going on almost a year and a half. I think I started it uh, last July, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and um, it started off really slow. I basically just blasted my friends and <laughs> asked them to like my page, which that's, that's how it starts. <laughs> didn't work out too well, you know. Especially since the reason, kind of the reason I started the page was because I was posting on my personal page quite a bit, and yeah. most of my friends took no interest whatsoever in it. So it was kind of annoying to be posting stuff that. You know, I thought was interesting or of value or whatever, and yeah. you know, one person would like it out of six hundred or so. Yeah. So I blasted them, got like a hundred likes or so over the course of several months, and then I was like, "Listen, I got to figure out a way to get more likes." So basically, what I started doing was going on the other um, libertarian, voluntarist, um, Austrian economics-minded pages. And responding to their posts with either something funny or whatever the case may be, and yeah. saying, you know, please check out my page and like it as well. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure, yeah. that's probably how you found it, actually. Uh, I don't even remember. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I guess <laughs> I just I just stumbled upon. There was just there was just a moment in time when I was just like liking every single libertarian. I was like I was like <laughs> thirsty for knowledge, you know. And I was sure. Like, it's, it's just yeah. So anyway, yeah, we're up to like almost six thousand now, and yeah, it's nice. Uh, you know, I try and keep the posts flowing. It's mostly you know simple memes that I think are funny or you know applicable to current times or whatever. Yeah. But you know, I you had been responding to some of my posts, and I think that was when I was like, "Hey, Danilo, uh, how would you like to 
yeah. be a moderator on the page as well. And now you're posting your uh, podcasts, and sometimes you post blogs and stuff like that, which I think is a great addition. And I'm hoping um, to do more writing of my own in the future. And yeah, I also... You know who Mark Dice is? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. I'd like to do videos like his style, too, but not as abrasive. <laughs> um, you mean, you, like mean not, videos, you mean not calling but... you mean not calling people zombies, right? In public? Yeah. Hey, mindless <laughs> zombie. Like, I, don't, I just don't think that works very well. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking, actually, of, like, a way to, like, entice people, say like, bring a piece of silver with me and say, listen, I have a few questions for you, and if you answer four out of five correctly, you can win this piece of silver. Yeah, yeah. And nobody will ever answer four out of the five questions yeah. I have for them correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if they do, they deserve the piece of silver, and <laughs> nice. I'll be happy to give it to them. But, yeah, I think that that's a way to, you know, maybe reach more people as well. By sure, that's videos. Awesome. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, I consider doing videos like his also. Um, like, I, I saw um, one video he was trying to pay for a taco, like, with, with one ounce gold piece. <laughs> I saw that one. <laughs> yeah, that was good. And then, um, and then another one uh, where he was trying to sell his, his one ounce gold um, Canadian maple leaf for the face value. <laughs> Like twenty dollars, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, for twenty five dollars. Like he's like, I, he's like, yeah. I've got this for fifty dollars. I'm selling it for twenty five. You know, I need, <laughs> and nobody thought it was worth it. And it, he, I think he was like right outside of a gold and silver yeah. shop too when he did it, so yeah. people could have gone right in yeah, yeah, and yeah. sold it for like over a thousand dollars. Oh yeah, yeah. You know that that's one <laughs> that, that's one topic that's excellent to talk to people uh, to get them kind of interested in thinking about. Um, Austrian economics, which is you know precious metals, I find yes. that's an excellent way because uh, so many people have no idea the um, you know the value of what precious metals you know and why they're not money anymore, and that you know just the very fact that they used to be money, nobody even, right. nobody even realizes that unless you know you're an older generation. Um, <laughs> but one thing I like to tell people is uh, you know I say um, a one dollar bill, right, Federal Reserve note. Um, how much do you think it costs for the federal government to print a one dollar bill? What, what, what do you think? How much do you think it costs? <laughs> what would you say? Well, if I had to guess, um, probably less than a cent. About uh, about six cents, I tell. Six about cents. six cents, okay? And I say, okay, so how much do you think it costs for them to print a hundred dollar bill? The same. <laughs> I would well, well, it's actually a little bit different. It's seven cents because they have the extra zero, so it's a little more ink, right? <laughs> okay. So, and then and then I tell them that, and they're like, "What? Really? That's it? yeah. <laughs> yes, right. it's just paper. You know, yeah. they just like there's just like um, printing this stuff mile a minute." You know, and and you know, laughing all the way to the bank, and we're there like like hamsters on a wheel. You know, working our asses off, trying to, you know, yeah. trying to feed our family, put our kids through college or whatever, right? Yeah. Meanwhile, they're printing that. Uh, I think right now the rate is like seventy-five billion dollars a month or something like that that they're giving to uh, banks as I, loans. Yeah, I heard. I heard that they're, that they're actually trying to that the Fed is actually trying to cut off completely. Like, like they're, they're actually they are tapering. But, you know, I, I don't see that. It, <laughs> if, if they do that, I don't really see a good result because it seems to me that the market is genuinely addicted to this cheap money. You know, yeah. I, I don't think, especially the stock market, you know, that, that the stock market is like booming right now, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, big time. And I don't think that it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep going up because, you know, it's like, it's like you, look at, you look at graphs of the money supply going up now and then you compare that with, Right before the crash of of twenty nine, it's pretty much identical, right? right? The only difference is that we're now more exaggerated. <laughs> you know, it's worse. Yeah. Right. So, uh, um, so yeah. Have you have you uh, looked into um, Mike Maloney stuff? Goldsilver dot com. Um, I don't know if I've been on his site, but I've definitely seen a few of his videos, and yeah. they're very good. Oh, yeah. He's, he's I like awesome. him a lot. He's excellent. Yeah. I've learned so much from him, um, and Robert Kiyosaki as well. 
Uh, yeah. You know, he wrote a bunch of books that I, I, I always recommend. He's got a bunch of videos too. He, he's teaching stuff. But um, but yeah, you know, precious metals. It's it's such a fascinating topic because um, you know, and that's that's basically I, I learned that from uh, what has government done to our money, right? Murray Rothbard, which is mm -hmm. excellent, excellent, tiny, tiny book, but excellent. Oh really? Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Oh, too. It's, it's like yeah, 60, 70 pages, but you know, excellent history of monetary. Uh, you know the monetary system, and you know different different items that uh, were used to be used as as money, like you know you know seashells, beads, feathers, right? Um, tobacco, oh. spices, salt, you know, sugar, whatever, and and why each of them uh, failed as a currency, <clears throat> right? And and actually, you think about it, even gold and silver, it can fail as a currency. It's not perfect, right? Like <laughs> like like if an asteroid hits Earth. That's full of gold and silver. That's an immediate. <laughs> that's an immediate hyperinflation, right? Sure, <laughs> that would be right. We have to have a lot of gold and silver. Yeah, we have to have a lot, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's possible, and but it's, it's possible. It, yeah, it's, yeah. So it's not perfect. It's just that it seems to be the best out of all the other alternatives. Yeah, you know? thousands of years it's been used off and on anyway as a currency, and it's worked pretty well until. The governments decide to manipulate it and phase it out completely. Usually, eventually, until it's pure fiat. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and <laughs> and uh, you know, I was reading in. I don't know if you read the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, Edward G. Edward Griffin. No, that's another one. That that's I've excellent, excellent book. That's another quite some time. Yeah, I read that in the very beginning, um, and. And he was basically, you know, he, t he goes in, in depth as well with the history of, you know, even more in depth than, than Murray Rothbard. And, you know, he talks about, you know, the, the evolution of money, you know, it starts off as, um, you know, um, it goes um, commodity, which is, you know, just trading the gold and silver coins. And then it goes receipt, which is, which is basically pre-1933, um, right, before uh, FDR, uh, um, you know, uh, took gold out of the currency altogether, right? It was it was you know money was a receipt for gold, right? And sure. Then, and then and then fractional reserve lending, which is you know, you know, um, it's like and then and fractional reserve lending is essentially a transition period to pure fiat, which is backed by nothing. So right. those four and I, and I read that I'm like wow that's <clears throat> an excellent way to explain it and and when yeah. I read, when I read that I called my cousin and I told him about it I was so excited <laughs> he didn't really <laughs> care for it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like yeah. I don't know. Do you have that experience? You know, you learn something that you find completely fascinating. You want to tell somebody, and they don't care. <laughs> you get yes, all too often. <laughs> like, like I don't know. Is it... you know. It's I. I get along with everybody, regardless, really, of you know what their political views are. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, one of my really close friends is like a died in the wool liberal quote unquote uh -huh. i use that word loosely because uh you know most liberals people who consider themselves liberals nowadays are more of the uh socialist ilk i would say um but yeah i mean you try and have conversations with these folks and they um you know they throw the roads argument at you pretty quick <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you know um larkin rose he's doing some excellent work right now in terms of uh how do you um, engage in a debate with a, with with a statist without insulting or offending them, right? So instead of putting putting them on the defensive, you know, with your all of your arguments, all you right. do, you, the the best thing to do, he was saying, is in in a in a Socratic fashion, you engineer certain questions so right, that yeah. they can they can stumble upon their own um, contradictions. <clears throat> Yeah, I like doing that quite a bit too. You know? It's definitely the way to go. Yeah, yeah, and, and so I it's inevitable to, that they will have contradictions in their thought. Yeah, yeah, and I try to do that as much as possible. You know, when I talk to people, like when I when I go to you know my parks and I and I talk to people at the park, and I, <laughs> I do that all the time. And uh, and I think I I try I try to get people thinking, like at least plant a little bit a little seed there. <laughs> Sure, <laughs> because you know it, it usually doesn't end well if you start the <laughs> if you if you start the conversation with I'm an anarchist, you know does it does it <laughs> it doesn't set good groundwork, you know? Yeah, people <laughs> just don't 
you know, the term's just associated with violence and chaos just because of, I yeah. think, our educational system and yeah. people don't understand that the meaning of anarchy means without rulers, not without rules. Yep. Um, and every society, a well-run society, is going to have rules. And I think, you know, ultimately the non-aggression principle is closely associated with the golden rule. I mean, everybody wants to be treated with respect and dignity and not have their rights violated. Um, and I think the non-aggression principle is you know, really perfect for that. And people you know, need to tell them anarchy is not necessarily without rules. It, it, I mean, without rulers. It is without rulers, not without rules. Yeah, yeah. So I actually have my yeah, I know that. On right here. <laughs> no rulers. Very nice. I like it. <laughs> Where'd you get that from? Is that non uh, non aggression apparel? Yes, I believe. No, he told me the link when I, I bought it. I can't remember. I'll have to tell you when we're offline. Oh, is that, is that that's Michael Shanklin, right? That's Michael Shanklin. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I bought a couple of things from him as well over at the uh, at Pork Fest in New Hampshire. Oh, Fest. that's right. You went there. That's right. So, so tell me about I didn't that. see him, but I saw a couple of the... Uh, he had a booth there, or Non-Aggression Apparel had a booth there. Oh, nice. He had shirts and bumper stickers and all that. Um, unfortunately, I had to work the whole week, so um, I only made it up for the weekend. Yeah. But it was pretty amazing. I mean, just being around so many like-minded people. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you can turn and talk to anybody, <laughs> and you're going to have things in common with cool. them. Yeah. Most, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. most things in common. So um, it was funny. At one point, everybody was staying up late. They had a big bonfire, and, you know, everybody's just talking and having a great time. And there was one... Part, um, where somebody was camped out and they had a sign up that said feel free to cut through this campground because I guess you know protocol is typically that you'll walk around rather than cut through people's campgrounds so he had that sign up and um, I ended up just crossing through and sitting with this guy he was actually from New York as well uh -huh. I forget what part and I don't even remember his name but we talked for like 45 minutes and uh -huh. you know pretty much you have like the same stories as people about yeah. how you're you evolve to become you know from a statist i think yeah. we all kind of start as a statist of one type or another just because of how we were brought up unless you were maybe homeschooled or unschooled yeah, which yeah. most of us weren't and, uh, so tell me so, about, t tell me about you how you, your progression to um to volunteerism how did you start so, yeah, I wasn't really too into politics until probably in my early to mid-twenties, and I was actually on a an automobile forum online where there was a political section, and very ironically, there was a police officer that was a member of this car forum. It was yeah. the Lincoln Market, and um, he had, you know, libertarian views, which was surprising. I think he was pretty anti-war on drugs in particular. You know, he hated the fact that marijuana was illegal and, you know, technically he was supposed to arrest somebody if he pulled them over and yeah. on marijuana on them, which yeah. is, you know, it's a victimless crime, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, not only that, but he was the one who introduced me to the issues of the, the debt situation in this country, and basically told me the progression of, you know, how all great empires, what they go through. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but, you know, they go from apathy to such and such. And, you know, basically, I think at that point, this was like maybe 2003, and we had like $5 trillion in debt. And he was just telling me, you know, the rate things are going with all these wars that are going on and the spending it's just completely unsustainable and, you know, he expected a monetary collapse at some point, which I think most of us expect at some point, but Austrians can't necessarily predict when it will happen, but if you follow along this path, it's inevitable. Yeah. And, uh, 
So he got me thinking about that type of stuff, and uh, that's, that's, you know, that's ironic. A, a police officer got you thinking about it. That's kind of pretty ironic. Yeah, I know. Totally <laughs> unbelievable because most police officers <clears throat> probably don't consider themselves libertarians, or if they do, they're probably neocons that call themselves <laughs> libertarians. Perhaps, yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, and then um. A friend pointed me in Ron Paul's direction in 2007. He's like, oh, yeah, this Republican congressman from Texas. You have to check him out. I'm like, you're kidding me. A Republican congressman? I'm going to hate this guy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I started watching YouTube videos. i like, I love this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, he lined up with my views and... Basically tricked me into becoming an anarchist. <laughs> tricked me. <laughs> I know, right? He tricked, he tricked all of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you, you met him, right? Yeah, I, um, I got to shake his hand twice, actually. Nice. Uh, I went to Exeter, New Hampshire, when he announced his run in 2012 and saw his town hall speech, which was just unbelievable. And then I went to another town hall meeting of his in both times. Um, got to shake his hand a couple other times I saw him speak but didn't actually meet him afterwards but yeah, yeah very cool experiences wow. so have you read any of his books <laughs> yeah I read and the fad the revolution um, I think one other one but it's escaping me right now so so what what books uh, like really changed your mind the, you know your thought processes actually the Law by Frederick Bastiat, which I saw Ron Paul recommend in an interview. He was on Fox News, and at the end of the interview, this was when he was running for president, and I think they were interviewing multiple candidates, and they asked each one, which book would you recommend if you could recommend any book? And he said The Law by Frederick Bastiat, and uh, I've read it a couple of times, and it's on YouTube as well, so I've listened to it on YouTube, and... Uh, the way that Bastiat puts things is just so simple to uh, understand. Uh, yeah. I think for everybody, I can't. I can't imagine that anybody could listen to that with an or read the book with an open mind. You know, no matter what their viewpoint was, and not come come away with you know different yeah. ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some. <clears throat> yeah, some some writers just like slap you in the face. <laughs> They're yeah, right, right. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, yeah, the law, um, <clears throat> yeah, I remember Tom Woods talking a lot about it, and Lou Rockwell, uh, you know, he, pre he influenced me a lot, and, uh, he recommended I, I read the, uh, Anatomy, or, or, I mean, you know, in a podcast, he recommended that, to read, um, Anatomy of the State, and, um, and that was basically my first, you know, major, I guess, anarcho-capitalistic reading, you know, that was right after the creature from Jekyll Island, and then you know, then what? What has government done to the money? And then you know, the case for the hundred uh, percent gold dollar, um, Murray Rothbard, and then yeah, it just <laughs> snowballed from there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's you know? what happens. You know? <laughs> and also another one that was really awesome was uh, uh, Larkin Rose's uh, book, "The Most Dangerous Superstition." Have you have you checked that one out? No, but I've you know listened to several podcast that he's been on oh yeah yeah he's excellent he's yeah excellent. i definitely that's another one on my list of things to read for sure oh my god larkin rose uh, you know the way he strikes me is like he just seems like a very casual you know everyday sort of guy <laughs> but his arguments are so airtight you know that so airtight, you know yeah. you can't you can't penetrate them at all and i've seen i i, I saw this one interview or it was like a debate he did with a lawyer. It was like two and a half hour debate, right? <laughs> I think just, I might have seen that actually. That yeah. Tom Tom Wilcox, I think. Yes, yeah. I did see that. <laughs> he it just demolished great. the guy with simple <laughs> simple questions, you know. The <laughs> right. It's great, and and actually the guy Mark Stevens that does a similar thing, you know, very simple questions, but he focuses more on the logical fallacies, and you know, just say you know, see, this is the. The bandwagon logical fallacy. This is the appeal to tradition. This is the appeal to <laughs> you know, the black and white fallacy. So it's it's really fascinating how <clears throat> once you uh, you know really closely dissect these statist arguments, they just crumble. You know they don't stand the light of day at all. And 
and I really hope to uh, to to uh, you know gain those kind of debating skills. That's my that's, that's my goal. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> you know? Luckily, we have so many awesome resources online that you know we can sharpen our own skills with, and yeah. um, I guess it's just a matter of having the time to do so, which I really admire you for taking the risk to you know step away from the business that you were a part of for a long time to you know dedicate yourself to this that's so unbelievable and you know you really have a way with words too i (laughs) listen to your podcast and read your blogs and i really think that you know you need to be heard by more people as well (laughs) you're welcome (laughs) (laughs) yeah I, i love doing it you know i um I owe a lot of uh, of uh, debt of gratitude to Michael Shanklin because uh, I always wanted to do a YouTube channel, you know, and make videos about. It, but I never knew, I never knew, like, how should I start? Like, how, should I do man in the street, like Mark Dice stuff, or should I do just me talking? You know, I never really knew how to start until um, until Mike Shanklin came and he just proposed this thing to me. He's like, "Do you want to be a part of this?" I'm like, "What? That's cool," you know. So. He right. pushed. He really pushed me to do that, and he yeah. pushed a lot of us. And I just, I just went with it, and like, I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. Man. You know, because you know, I love to write, but then I recognize that there's a, a segment of the population that just don't like to read. Right. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And and they would much prefer to hear a podcast or watch a video, and uh, and and so you know, if you just write then you're completely shutting out that portion of the population, right? <clears throat> so, so it, it, you know, it's great to have all these different venues and, uh, you know, ways to reach people. Yeah. So. <laughs> and there's a lot of great pages out there, too, like Unbiased America. Uh-huh. Um, we Are Capitalists and um, several other ones where, you know, they break down a lot of the information, statistics, and make posts on it. And yeah. it's like, you know, these are things that anybody can look at and, yeah. you know, gain more insight from. Um, but, you know, it's it bugs me to look at these pages that are so great and see that they have, like, 5,000 or 20,000 likes, and then you look at, like, some, you know, pop culture type pages that have <laughs> millions of likes and you're like, just feel, feels like you're banging yeah. the big head against the wall because <laughs> like, uh, people what, what, just don't care enough. And, and what, what, what is that uh, being liberal? Does that have like a million likes or something? I think somewhere around that, <laughs> yeah. And then, I think Obama has his own Facebook page too and he's got like a couple of million too, right? <laughs> sure he does, yes. <laughs> But uh, so so let me ask you, like you just mentioned the word capitalist, and I was thinking, you know how how um, perverted that word has become. So so do you? I'm sure you get people that that you know blame capitalists for all the problems that we have. You know so so what do you tell those people? How how do you describe it? <laughs> um, we don't have capitalism. Um, there's you know capitalism implies free markets, and um, you know. The money, basically, is the root of trade. Um, You have to have a currency or multiple currencies to be able to trade. And when you have legal tender laws forcing businesses to accept dollars and making it, you know, more difficult for them to trade in, you know, other currencies aside from the dollar, you automatically don't have a free market there. Never mind, like... I don't know, what are there, 80,000 pages of federal regulation at this point? (laughs) So, and then, you know, you socialize the the losses and privatize the profits. Mm -hmm. So these big banks are making all this money, and not only banks, but certain corporations as well that are, you know, in the pocket of all these politicians. So, you know, they're basically getting all these benefits and the regulations are pushing out small businesses in many cases and Mm -hmm. stifling competition. So I don't know how anybody in their right mind could consider that to be capitalism. Exactly. It's pure corporatism. 
Yeah, I, I um I like Daniel Rothschild. He he uh, explained it well when he said that um, the reason he doesn't like the term crony capitalism is because it's like saying um, rape is crony lovemaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? I would say that's pretty accurate. You know, it's like it's like the the crony capitalism and capitalism is so diametrically opposed that when you put capitalism in that in the same term it confuses people you know and they think you know that's just capitalism but it's not so that's why i prefer to call it something completely different like like corporate fascism right, right. that like something like that is more descriptive and uh, i think clearly uh, delineates what exactly we have today that it's nowhere near what capitalism is true capitalism uh, um, <laughs> and then it reminds me of that other meme which is like capitalism ha has been funding all the other isms for the past 4,000 years <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly that's so true you know and, and it's like you know like, like Margaret Thatcher would say uh, she said uh, you, you know socialism is a great idea until you run out of other people's money right <laughs> yeah so which is basically you know most of the uh, <clears throat> Um, you know the interventionist uh, e economies in the world are socialist economies, right? Now, I guess on on different uh, magnitudes, right? You know we are we are trending towards full scale communism right now, right? Full scale socialism. So it's just it's just a matter of degree, right? Yeah, I mean I think people still or a lot of people rather operate under this assumption that the U.S. is one of the freest economies in the world, and I guess it. It is if you compare it to, like, North Korea yeah. or, you know, <laughs> other countries like that. But, I mean, uh, if you look at the Economic Freedom Index, I think it's usually put out by the Heritage Foundation. Yeah. Every year it seems like we're dropping lower and lower yeah. and lower. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're lower than Canada at this point. And people will look at Canada like it's a socialist country. Yeah. Uh, and the fact of the matter is they're actually more economically free than the U.S. <laughs> at this point. Yeah. Um, to taxes, regulations, etc. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except, I guess, uh, I, I think their health care is, is a little more uh, restricted than ours, though, in a certain yeah. sense, right? That's, that would be right. just the only thing. But, um, We're getting there. But, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I mean, I mean, how, how would you uh, respond to somebody who said, you know, you, you tell them how, how you know, um, economically unfree we are, and then they say, well, look around you. We're the richest country in the world. We have the biggest military. How can you say we're so, you know, what would you say to somebody like that? We're so wealthy. <laughs> what would oh, you I mean, yeah, I guess they're, right now things are still pretty good overall. But it's a lot of it is due to the fact that the Federal Reserve is printing so much money and the dollar is still the reserve currency of the world. And that is by force. If we didn't have that great military, the dollar probably would already be a thing of the past. Yeah. The U.S. dollar, anyway. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's being held together right now, and things are good for most people, but, um, you know, it's kind of a house of cards, so to speak. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, you know, th this is what I picked up a lot from what, um, reading Larkin Rose and watching his videos is, how much of our society hinges on the belief in the myth of authority, right? So, you know, like you said, um, <clears throat> the dollar is the world reserve currency, right? It's a petrodollar uh, by force, right? It's only as powerful as, a military, as, as our military is able to enforce it, right? But then again, you have to realize where does the military, where, you know, where, do we, where does the military get all that power? And basically, it's, it's those people who believe um, that our system is necessary, and so they f they're there to enforce a you know um, a fascistic system, right? And if those people really believed, the people in the military and the police really believed that you know this was unnecessary, and they just quit, <laughs> it would completely unravel, right? It, so and you also so see like. And I don't know that it's 100% true or not, but, you know, I heard that um, 
Muammar Gaddafi, for example, in Libya was trying to institute a, uh, a gold back yeah. currency. Yeah, I heard that. And then, go figure, he's the next person on the list to take out, and now he's gone. So, you know, you know when you see things like this happening and these wars and everything, all the bombing that's happening all the time, it's for a reason, and they're trying to maintain their, their control. Yeah, yeah. Another fascinating thing, uh, you know, regarding the Middle East is before nine eleven, there were I think seven countries in the world that did not have a central bank, <laughs> and then right after nine eleven, you know, two countries gained a central bank. <laughs> Iraq and Afghanistan. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Coincidentally, the ones that we invaded, right? Yeah. And 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 this is this is also what I tell people at uh, you know when I talk to people about um, the monetary system is you know what does that say to you you know um, it basically says that you know the countries that are not owned by you know um, that are not indebted to a central bank are you know the next on the list right and so now it's yeah. like now it's like down to three countries I think that don't have a central bank Cuba North Korea and Iran. And, you know, who are we trying to go to war with now? Iran. <laughs> yeah. Right? They're definitely on the list. You know? So. And, uh, you know, they're allies with Syria, if I'm not mistaken. So Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, this military action in Syria, I think people are taking it a little bit lightly and not realizing the implications of it or potential implications. I mean... This is how world wars start yeah. when, yeah, yeah. you know, countries start over extending themselves and intervening in affairs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's pretty scary what could happen. And you know if anything happens here, you know, a terrorist attack or a false flag attack or whatever the case may be, you know, Americans overwhelmingly are going to back war even more. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't see it going the other way, unfortunately. Although, you know, you would think that people could look at it objectively and say, hey, we're occupying all these countries over there, propping up dictators, overthrowing democratically elected governments, bombing these countries, seven different countries since Obama has been elected, and I think uh, George Bush bombed four of them, and then... We expect no retaliation whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, come on. And, um, you know, innocent people die, and they expect that um, these fathers aren't going to become more radicalized. How dare you fight back? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I never it, justify the killing of innocent people by any means whatsoever, but, I mean... It's blowback, and the CIA knows that, and unfortunately, the American people don't. Yeah, and uh, you know, you know, uh, one one argument, interesting argument, I get by uh, some of my family members is, um, is, but we need government because if there's no if there's no government to protect us from the corporations that pollute the air, the water, and the soil, we're gonna be like everything's gonna be poisoned, right? <laughs> Right, and and to me, what that t does not take into account is is all of the you know genocide, mass murder, you know you know drone strikes, nuclear detonations <laughs> that, that occur with the state. <laughs> yeah, that occur with the state, and all you're focusing on is you know the occasional poisoning of a stream. <laughs> right, right, as if it's that justifies you know. <laughs> Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if you saw the post I made uh, the other day, but there was somebody posted a libertarian stream, and supposedly it was um, a picture of a river in China that was completely littered. And what they failed to take into account is that's a country with a massive government. It's not a libertarian country by any means, and yet they have massive amounts of pollution, yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's not uh, necessarily a government that's going to keep um, streams and air, etc., clean and take care of the environment. Um, yeah. You know, I think that a strong argument could be made that people privately owning land 
rivers, oh, yeah. etc., oh, yeah. are going to take better care of it than oh, governments. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, the tragedy of the commons. And I, I, uh, I was reading this one article, they were saying, you know, maybe how would we divide the ocean into private, <laughs> privately owned portions? <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would be interesting. But how do you do that? That's kind of, uh, kind of difficult logistically, right? <laughs> Right, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, but yeah, let's. Uh, I guess we should finish up. We're getting to a fifty-minute mark. Um, so let me just um, ask you if if people want to I guess uh, reach you, how would they uh, reach your work or your business? Or do you have a website? Um, right now, I just have my Facebook page, which is Living in Modern Times. Um, people can always add me on my personal page as well. Although there are several Steve Norths out there who oh, may yeah. be able to find me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen some other ones on Facebook as well. Um, uh, you can also be reached by email. Uh, my email address is steve.norte at gmail.com and um, yeah, I definitely like to you know, get to know more like-minded people and um, you know, keep Keep learning. Excellent. Excellent. Any other uh, last message you want to end with? <laughs> um, no, not really. I mean, I just really appreciate you inviting me to be on your podcast. It's really an honor. And, um, you know, I appreciate all the work and effort that you're putting in and trying to spread the message of voluntary, peaceful anarchism and Austrian economics. And, um, uh, you know, it's absolutely a message worth spreading. That's why I started my page, and you know, I hope to keep it up and try and do even more in the future. And, uh, you know, hopefully at some point in time, it will become much more popular and widespread, and we can actually see um, the effects of the fruits of all of our efforts. Hopefully. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's definitely something worth uh, striving and fighting for, right? Although, uh, absolutely. Although not necessarily fighting violently, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. fighting peacefully. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, I, was, I was actually reading recently uh, how they were saying during um, uh, during nonviolent um, demonstrations and protests, like sometimes there's um, government provo provocateurs that infiltrate these peaceful demonstrations and intentionally cause violence to yeah. to discredit the you know peaceful gathering. Um, it happens all the time. It's so ridiculous, and you know, it just goes to show how desperate they are to keep yeah. up this this game. The facade. Yes. Oh, excellent. Well, good talking to you, Steve. Uh, thank you very good much for the opportunity. So this thank is, you. You're welcome. So this is uh, Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Uh, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.